Can I welcome everyone to the 26th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018? And I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. And as meeting papers are provided in digit format, digital format, the tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, item one, the committee is invited to consider whether to take consideration of its approach to the fuel poverty target definition and strategy, Scotland Bill, at agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, agenda item, this is day three of the stage two of the planning bill. And I welcome again the, the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his accompanying officials to today's meeting. Some S MSPs who are not committee members but have lodged amendments to the bill will again be in t attendance today and are very welcome, and I welcome Daniel Johnson at this point. Some of the MSPs are not present just now but will be popping in uh, later on. Uh, we move on to Amendment 74 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Yeah. Um, well, thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, in this group on the local development plan consultation and participation, uh, I'm speaking to three amendments, 74201 and 7077. Um, now, I'm, I'm not alone in thinking that the front loading of the planning system has not been fully thought through uh, when drafting this bill. I appreciate what the bill is, is attempting to do, uh, but although the Scottish Government say they want a more front-loaded system, I don't think they've designed one in this bill. So in response to this, uh, I've genuinely tried to be helpful. I've tabled several amendments, some in other groupings, uh, that aim to improve the front-loading and public participation in the planning system. Uh, and I'm working on more um, for stage three, and I'm open to uh, speaking to anyone, including the minister, um, about this. I'm genuinely trying to be constructive about this. Amendments 74 and 201 uh, work to provide specific directions as to how a planning authority must ensure they encourage and welcome public participation. Um, uh, that's what these uh, amendments are all about. Um, so we're here, we're here a lot, uh, as we did during the uh, written consultation period, that members of the public feel ignored by the planning process. Uh, Amendment 74 uh, is intended uh, to uh, provide uh, a route um, where uh, people can uh, get more, more involved. Um, however, um, uh, in Amendment 74, um, the very last line um, says that councils should issue a copy uh, of the statement of the local development plan to each household in their district. Now, having um, spoken to um, other members and stakeholders, um, I am now of the view that that is uh, too, too onerous on councils. Um, so I'll not be moving this amendment, but uh, the sentiments behind it um, stand uh, in that I want uh, people to be uh, more involved. I think uh, Monica Lennon's uh, amendment on the same subject uh, allows a greater degree of flexibility, so we'll be supporting you, that. Could you, could you move that uh, amendment for the sake of the debate and you can remove it later? Withdraw it later. Move it now. I'll move it, yes. Okay. I can move all the amendments. Yeah. Okay, um, so amendment um, 201. Um, is about the Scottish Government issuing guidance uh, on uh, effective community engagement, same sort of subject. That's backed by the RTPI. That one still stands, that works. Um, now, Amendment 77, um, this refers to the Central Scotland Green Network. Now, that covers 19 council areas, so more than half the local authorities in Scotland. The amendment, if passed, would ensure that those councils have to consult the CSGN on any proposed local development plans. The CSGN is it's a vitally important project uh, dedicated to protecting and enhancing the green lungs of a large part of Scotland. And it's essential they're formally involved in the planning system, in my view. The network uh, was uncomfortable with another amendment I'd tabled, so I've withdrawn that one. They didn't think they could work with it. 
but they're happy with this one. Uh, and Chairman Keith Geddes told me, quote, to achieve positive outcomes in the 19 councils in our area, a fundamental building block would be that councils incorporate the principles of CSGN into their local development plans. If we're a national priority, that priority should be incorporated at a local level. Close quotes. Um, so I think that makes sense. Um, the area I represent is also covered by Central Scotland Green Network. They do a fantastic job. Uh, and I think uh, they should be uh, certainly involved at that local development plan stage. So I hope the committee uh, supports Amendment 77. Thank you very much. Um, Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 112 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'll speak to 112 and all other amendments in my name in this group. Um, amendment 112 would put a duty on the Planning Authority to promote the Local Development Plan to local residents um, in such a manner as they consider sufficient to ensure that it's brought to the attention of residents of the area or district to which the LDP relates. Um, furthermore, 112 also requires the Planning Authority to publish a yearly statement which sets out the steps they've taken to promote the local development plan. So the purpose of this is to strengthen early engagement in the development of the plan um, put a, a duty on the authority to promote the plan to local residents and set out publicly how they have done so. So it's about some accountability around that. Um, of course, there are different different needs and requirements across different planning authorities, depending on geography, population size and so on. Um, but I believe that Amendment 112 reflects the requirement for authorities to promote the LDP, but still allows flexibility for local decisions to be taken on how best to achieve this. Um, I welcome the, the comments from Graeme Simpson on his Amendment 74. Um, I did feel that issuing a, a copy of a statement to every household through the post might be um, unnecessary and there may be um, are less prescriptive options available. So I'm, I'm glad that, that, that Graeme Simpson won't be pressing um, that amendment because I wouldn't have been able to, to support that one. Uh, my other amendments in this group are aimed at strengthening community voices during the consultation phase of local plan preparation. 194 will introduce specific requirements for the planning authority to consider and facilitate the particip participation, easy for me to say, of children and young people in the preparation of the local development plan. And I think this is important because decisions that we take um, around planning will affect the lives of children and young people for, for decades to come. So it is only right that they are properly consulted. Um, involving children and young people should result in places that better cater for their needs long into the future and help to develop citizens who have a good understanding of what planning can achieve and why participating matters. As a minimum, my amendment references schools, youth councils and youth parliament representatives as a point of contact for consulting young people on the plan. And schools are also a mechanism by which awareness of the local plan can also reach uh, parents, families, the wider school community. This amendment also introduces a duty for the authority to publish up-to-date information about how it's gone about meeting its obligations to involve the views of children and young people in the preparation of the plan. As we'll all know, the UK is a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the Scottish Government have asserted in the most recent programme for government that they will incorporate the principles of convention into domestic law. Paramount to UNCRC is recognition that children are entitled in equal parts to protection, provision and participation. So I hope the Scottish Government will take the opportunity to put its commitments on protecting the rights of children, particularly since it is the year of young people, into action in the planning bill by supporting my amendments. Amendment 118A would adjust Amendment 118 to ensure that the views of children and young people will be sought during the preparation of the evidence report. Um, Amendment 198 seeks to ensure that in preparing the evidence report, young people will be consulted and that the planning authority must consult with the general public and existing statutory consultees for planning applications. Um, I recognise that much of the principle of 198 is similar to what the Minister is trying to achieve in his Amendment 118. So I, I will support Amendment 118, but I will press my own 
um, and I hope we can achieve some or reach consensus on what should be required um, in preparation of the evidence report for stage three. Um, I won't press Amendment 197 because 197 and 198 um, are quite similar, but 198 um, includes the provision about children and young people, so I won't be pressing 197. My Amendment 202 will give community councils and access panels the right to be consulted in the preparation of the LDP. Access panels work in their local areas to improve the built environment and promote social inclusion for disabled people, whilst community councils where they exist provide an additional democratic link with local communities. Consulting access panels at an early stage should result in places which are accessible for all and help to embed equality for people with disabilities into the planning process. Um, I had a look at the briefing from Disability Equality Scotland. Um, access panels are all fully constituted members of Disability Access Scotland and are recognised by local authorities. And in their briefing, they said that um, too often access panels are consulted too late in the process. Um, and this um, leaves the knowledge and experience of the access panels as a tick box exercise. I don't think any of us would, would want that to, to be the case. Um, so across Scotland, consultation with access panels really does vary in terms of the quality of that. Um, but I think giving access panels the right to be consulted would, would level um, the playing field convener. Okay, thank you very much. Minister, to speak to Amendment 118 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Um, I'll first of all speak to Amendments 118 and 121 in my name, uh, which seek to strengthen involvement in local development plans. Uh, during Stage 1, the committee and many stakeholders uh, were keen to ensure that the changes to the process of preparing local development plans should result in greater engagement, uh, particularly uh, with those groups in society who may not always have their voices heard. Uh, this, of course, is my aim too. An early and effective engagement in the preparations of plans which set out the future of our, uh, future of our places is critical uh, to their success. Um, I originally intended to provide more detail on this in secondary legislation and guidance. However, in response to the committee's concerns and to underline our commitment to this, I undertook to bring forward amendments so that stronger opportunities for engagement in development planning are included on the face of the bill. Uh, amendments 118 and 119 set out specific requirements for engagement at the early crucial stages or the crucial early stages even, of plan preparation. Uh, Amendment 118 uh, will require planning authorities to seek and have regards to the views of key agencies, the public at large, and others as may be prescribed when preparing their evidence reports. Attach uh, Amendment 119 will require them to report on how they have done so uh, and how the views expressed have been taken into account. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring gypsy travellers are properly involved in planning the future of their places. I also agree with the independent panel that children and young people need to be more actively involved in the future of their places. Uh, the report on consultation will be specifically required to cover these groups. Under Amendment 118, children and young people are those aged 25 and under, uh, and, and under. Uh, the definition of gypsy travellers is to be defined in regulations because there is not, to date, a definition in Scots law. Uh, we will engage with the community in establishing that definition. Uh, Monica Lennon's linked amendment 118A also reflects the need to involve uh, children and young people. While I agree with the intention, I do not consider it appropriate to specify particular groups of children and young people in primary legislation. It would be better for guidance to indicate the ways to engage with those who are not yet involved in these formal structures. I have the same difficulty with Amendments 194, 198 and 202. In Amendment 202, access panels are not statutory bodies and their roles and capacity differ across the country. 
Uh, I would hope that they would be involved with local development plans, but I feel that guidance would be a better way of ensuring each of them is engaged in the way that they find most appropriate. And I'm happy to have uh, further discussion with Ms Lennon uh, in that area of business. Uh, I cannot support um, amendments 197 and 198. Uh, these appear to introduce an additional step into the preparation of the evidence report by requiring a draft report to be consulted upon. This would lead to delay in plan preparation. And I want to see stakeholders playing an active part in the preparation of the evidence report rather than being consulted once it is drafted. Amendment 77 also raises concerns about the proper place for specific consultation requirements. Our general approach uh, in planning is to specify these in regulations where they can be adjusted as necessary. Um, I fully respect and support the Central Scotland Green uh, Network and would expect the relevant planning authorities to include its uh, coordinating organisation in their consultation. However, um, since the CSGN partnership was replaced by the CSGN Trust in March 2014, and who knows if there will be further changes to names, I think it would be wiser to keep such provisions in secondary legislation uh, where they can get, be kept uh, fully up to date. Uh, there are already a range of requirements within the 97 Act relating to the publication of documents at different stages and the provision of information about consultation. Section 20B requires the publication of an annual development plan scheme, including a participation scheme which sets out when consultation is likely to take place, with whom the forum it will take and the steps to be taken to involve the public at large. This must be published, which may be online, and a copy must be uh, placed in a public library. Section 20A requires similar publication of the local development plan and copies to be placed in public libraries. It all, must also be, ad, be advertised in a local newspaper and anyone who made representations on the proposed plan must be notified. These are the minimum requirements, but I'm also aware that authorities regularly go beyond this, especially using digital communications to good effect. Um, I've also seen frequent electronic newsletters and council publications that cover the plan. Ms Lennon's Amendment 112 uh, duplicates the requirement to publish the development plan with less detail, uh, and I don't believe that it adds any value. I'm pleased that Mr Simpson um, will not be moving Amendment 74, because um, uh, what he proposed would have been an extremely costly exercise even a second-class stamp for every household is around £1.5 million, um, and that there's no guarantee, of course, that people will read it. Um, I would prefer to see an emphasis on the quality of engagement and the use of a wider range of techniques to inspire more people to get involved, and I'm more than happy um, to talk to Mr Simpson and others around about that, um, because I do see exactly where he's coming from, um, and I want to see as many people involved um, as possible. Uh, Amendment 201, also from Mr Simpson, uh, would, suppo would support that quality engagement and uh, would build on the national standards for community engagement, uh, which were reviewed and updated in 2016. Uh, specific advice for planning authorities is contained in Planning Advice Note 3 slash 2010, published after the last suite of legislation following the 2006 Planning Act. Uh, this would, of course, require refreshing, uh, and the principles set out by Mr Simpson are ones that the Scottish will Government is uh, willing to support. I would therefore ask the committee to support Mr Simpson's Amendment 201. I would ask the committee to support Amendments 118, 119 uh, and 121 in my name, um, the amendment that I've just mentioned, 201, in the name of Mr Simpson, and to reject the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Minister. Does any other member wish to talk in this group? Okay. In that case, Graeme Simpson to wind up and press or withdraw. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think this is uh, pretty uncontroversial. I think we're all um, uh, on the same page. Um, it's just about how we get there. Um, so I welcome uh, the Minister's uh, words that he's uh, open to have further discussions. Um, 
is disappointing. He's uh, not uh, not backing Amendment 77 relating to the Central Scotland Green Network, but we'll have to uh, just... Uh, Simpson will take an intervention. I, I will. I, I do support the Green Network. As I said in, in, uh, in my speech, um, convener, what I worry about in these circumstances, if we set out something like this in primary legislation and there are name changes, which there have been, that's hard to revisit. Um, it's easier to revisit that in guidance. Um, I am more than willing to uh, discuss with Mr Simpson around about how we can set out that guidance. But I think that we may cause ourselves some difficulties if we set out certain things in primary legislation that's not easy to change if change itself comes from an organisation. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I hear, hear what the Minister says, but I really, um, the intention here is to really firm things up. Um, um, I, I'll, be, I'll be moving that uh, amendment today, uh, but uh, I'm certainly open to have further discussions ahead of stage three. Uh, and I think I'll leave it there, convener. I um, don't think there's been huge disagreements here. OK, right. thank you very much. Uh, in that case, Graham Simpson seeks leave to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? OK, in that case, the amendment is withdrawn. And I call Kenny Gibson to debate, amend, to move, sorry, Amendment 70, 175, uh, already debated with Amendment 86. Moved. The question is that Amendment 175 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Call Amendment 110 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 86. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not move. Sure. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with Amendment 86. Graeme Simpson to move or not move? Uh, moved. Okay. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour? Those opposed? The amendment falls, 5-2. Call amendment 75 in the name of Graeme Simpson, already debated with amendment 86. Graeme Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. OK. They, all those in favour? All those opposed? It falls, 4-3. OK. I call amendment... 111, in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 86. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not move. Sure. Call Amendment 176, in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 86. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 176 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The amendment is carried. I call Amendment 112 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 74. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? False, 4 3. I call Amendment 193 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I would point out that uh, Amendment 199, if 199 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 200 because of a preemption. Alec Cole Hamilton to move Amendment 193 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener, and I move the amendments in my name. Uh, grateful to have your forbearance again as an interloper on this committee. Um, my amendment seeks to reverse uh, provisions in the bill to remove the main issues report. Um, I reflected very much on your stage one report, and in paragraph 136 of that, you stated, your committee stated, we agree with witnesses that removing the main issues report could reduce the opportunities for engagement with stakeholders and communities. Uh, my party absolutely agrees with that, and on consultation with the leaders of all of my council groups across Scotland, um, this was seen as very much uh, a, a bastion for them that they wanted to protect. This speaks very much to the uh, reasoning behind my uh, movements uh, of amendments in um, the first hearings around stage two on uh, changing the NPF and, and removing some of the language around the NPF to reduce the preeminence of, of Scottish ministers. This is about um, local autonomy, this is about local consultation, and for my party, the main issues report represented a, a principal vehicle of consultation in that regard. So that's why I'm moving these amendments today. 
very much. Um, Graeme Simpson to speak to Amendment 8 and other amendments in the group. Thanks, Convener. Um, three, three amendments here, 876 and 120, which I'll move. Um, amendment 8 uh, relates directly to housing. Uh, it's, it's tabled to ensure the local development plan demonstrates the viability of housing sites, Convener, because too often sites are zoned for housing and then noth nothing happens uh, for years. We've all seen it. Um, so Amendment 8 uh, is, is, is designed to ensure that planning authorities uh, don't include allocations in their plans if they're not confident the development uh, can be achieved within the plan period. Uh, it could inspire them to better consider the viability uh, of meeting policy requirements. Uh, this would be particularly useful in respect of old sites that are reallocated in successive plans while new sites uh, uh, promoted by home builders and others uh, are subject to increasing scrutiny. The current practice favours old allocation over new, despite track re records of uh, non-delivery market and other changes. Uh, so if approved and subject to refinement at stage three, as you know, convener, I'm always up for refining uh, amendments. Uh, this, could, this amendment could be a useful tool in supporting the plan-led system. Um, amendment 76 uh, strengthens uh, the community links so that evidence reports demonstrate the way the planning authority has engaged with the local community to prepare the local place plan. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say more on that uh, in a, a later amendment, not in this group. Um, I support Amendment 200 in the name of Monica Lennon, which enhances uh, community engagement. And uh, that pretty much uh, covers it, I think. Amendment 120, that is also about the uh, evidence report. So it's all about enhancing that report. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 195 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Amendment 195 will require the Planning Authority to set out how it has consulted on the evidence report and how the views which were expressed during the consultation process have been taken into account. I'm pleased that the committee um, supported the retention of strategic development plans in our earlier session. My Amendment 226 is intended to ensure that any authority not within a strategic development partnership would be required within the preparation of the evidence report to state how they have taken into account cross-boundary policies and state the reasons, if any, for why they have not done so. So essentially this puts a duty on all planning authorities to engage in regional planning, even if they are not part of a strategic authority. This um, recognises the value of regional planning and that it deserves dedicated resources, even if planning authorities are not part of a strategic development plan authority. I um, appreciate Graeme Simpson's supportive comments for Amendment 200. The intention behind that was to strengthen the gate check process of the evidence report, um, to create a representative community panel, uh, to encourage positive and early community engagement in the planning process. However, I've been looking at this amendment again and I, I don't feel that it's satisfactory as it's currently drafted. So I want to do um, some further reflection on that. So I won't press this amendment convener, uh, but we'll look at it again um, for, for stage three. I'll, I'll be happy to speak to Graeme Simpson and others um, about that. Um, my final amendment in this group is 227. Um, that's the introduction of the play sufficiency assessment. Um, play is vital to children's physical and mental health, as well as building social networks and a sense of community. Um, the amendment highlights the importance of that space and will allow councils and government to be held to account if it starts to reduce or when we can see that every child doesn't have access to space to play. The right to play is embedded in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and this amendment is therefore completely in keeping with Scottish Government commitments to incorporate these principles into domestic law. Um, this approach has been taken already in Wales where a duty has been placed on local authorities to assess and secure sufficient play opportunities for children. So I do hope that the committee uh, and the government will be supportive um, of this. Um, in relation to other amendments in this group, um, 
Amendment 8, um, in the name of Graeme Simpson, um, on the issue of, of viability of, of housing sites. I'm supportive in principle, but I'm glad that, that Graeme Simpson recognises that it probably does need some refinement in terms of um, how local authorities would assess viability. I think the word apparent appears in the, the amendment too, which um, I think we'd probably need some clarity around that. So I think there's some work to be done on that, but supportive in principle. And um, I'm supportive of Amendment 196 in the name of Daniel Johnson, which would require authorities to assess the demand for and availability of student housing. Um, for some authorities, um, it's not... Oh, of course. It's an unusual to... uh, convener. It's just, um, I was just rereading Amendment 8 there, and the word apparent doesn't appear. Apologies, I perhaps was thinking of another amendment, but... Um, okay. I'll look again before we vote. Right. <laughs> um, on student housing, it's not going to be applicable in, in every area, but in other areas where there are uh, colleges or, or universities, um, I think it will encourage some transparency over the availability of student accommodation and the need to plan for this. Um, I know it's been an issue recently for, for me in, in South Lanarkshire um, involving the, the relocation of the University of West of Scotland um, campus. Um, so I think Daniel Johnson's amendment would require the authority to take account of the need for student accommodation and the impact on surrounding areas within the evidence report. And I think that's useful information to have when preparing um, the LDP. And lastly, can be on amendments by Alex Cole Hamilton. These would seek to retain the main issues report, um, which is being replaced by the evidence report. Um, I've proposed a number of amendments aimed at strengthening the evidence report, so I'm not able to support the amendments in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel Johnson to speak to Amendment 196 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. And can I thank the committee for uh, welcoming me here today uh, in what is, I think, very important work. Can I also make a, a brief declaration in that my wife is a practicing uh, planning uh, lawyer. Um, uh, Monica Lennon has set out many of the reasons why I'm, I'm bringing forward this amendment, um, but if I could briefly state, uh, student accommodation, uh, I think, is having a, a huge impact on, our, uh, on many of our towns and cities. Um, we've seen a, 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 a huge increase in the, the number of uh, developments of uh, uh, student accommodation, um, and I feel that the, the planning process and local development plans in particular need to take account of that. Um, in this city alone, um, some 20% of people in the city are connected to uh, universities and therefore I think adequate provision in the planning process is, is hugely important. Uh, in terms of uh, the way that my amendment would work, it's broadly similar to, to uh, Graeme Simpson's uh, um, Amendment uh, 8, uh, but I also think it's important in terms of, uh, I think, m moving forward. I think what's vitally important is that we uh, take account of affordability, the format and massing of student accommodation. Um, and, and I think that this uh, amendment makes an important, uh, uh, more, makes important progress on those points in ensuring that we have a diversity of student uh, uh, and, and that we uh, accommodate our students adequately when they are seeking to study. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, to speak to Amendment 119 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I cannot support uh, Amendments 193 uh, 199 and 203 from Alex Cole Hamilton. Um, they appear piecemeal, uh, they don't work on a technical level uh, and undermine improvements to development planning. Amendment 193 uh, looks to reinstate the monitoring report that accompanies the publication of the main issues report. Uh, we have proposed removing the requirement for the main issues report, uh, which communities found hard to understand. No amendment seemed to reinstate that. Therefore, this amendment would result in the monitoring report uh, being published from time to time, but with no particular stage or timescale specified for doing so. Amendment 203 also appears to replace a reference to the section on the evidence report uh, with a, a, a reference to the section on the main issues report, which, as I've already said, will no longer exist. The monitoring report summarises the evidence base for the plan, uh, the changes since the previous plan and the impacts of it. 
The evidence report would replace this and go further, therefore reinstating the monitoring report simply creates duplication. Amendment 199 uh, removes the requirement for ministers to appoint a person to assess the evidence report and for them to notify ministers and the authority if they are satisfied with the report. Um, this independent scrutiny is important uh, and members and stakeholders um, have welcomed this gate check stage in the process. Uh, on Amendment 8, in the name of Graham Simpson, um, I recognise that development plans should have a focus on delivery and that the sites that they allocate for development should be realistic and viable. However, this amendment raises a number of issues. Um, firstly, timing. Um, at the gate check stage, the focus will be on evidence and information to, inf or, uh, to inform the plan uh, rather than on allocating sites. The amendment may also mean that land with significant potential, uh, for example, sites that will make a significant contribution to the land supply or will support regeneration, cannot be included in the development plan regardless of their merits if, that site, if the site proposer cannot meet the information requirements. I'm also um, somewhat concerned about uh, time and cost this could add to the process. And our recent research on this showed that whilst more information would be helpful, it also comes at a not uh, insignificant cost to the prospective developer. The amendment would apply to sites which may not progress to the proposed local development plan, generating increased risk um, for site proposers. Uh, Recognising this, the research suggested that a stage approach uh, could help to ensure that information requirements do not disadvantage smaller developers or act as a barrier to investment. And we intend to develop fuller guidance based on this research rather than to introduce a blanket requirement. Um, this is another example of where um, a well-intentioned new duty could prove very difficult to implement uh, without gen generating um, uh, the unintended consequences. And I would ask um, Mr Simpson not to move this amendment. Again, I'm more than happy to have discussions uh, around about this, but there are unintended consequences here, I think. Uh, Mr Simpson's Amendment 76 is linked to a requirement uh, we will come to later uh, for planning authorities to invite communities to prepare local place plans as part of the pre preparation of the local development plan. Um, I want to look at that later amendment in more detail uh, to ensure local place plans continue to be truly community-led, uh, but I have no objection to the requirement to report on this issue and on the assistance uh, that they have provided community bodies. I also support Amendment 120 uh, to introduce a requirement for the full council of a local authority to approve uh, uh, an evidence report before it is submitted to Scottish ministers. Uh, I believe this would help with strengthening corporate responsibility for the plan. Uh, and this would align with the proposal in the bill uh, for the proposed plan to be signed off by the full council. Uh, of a local authority. Uh, amendment 195 is consequential on Ms Lennon's amendments 197 and 198, which we've already spoken about. Similarly, I have made points in statutory requirements for consultation with access panels, um, and I do not support Amendment 202. Ms Lennon's Amendment 200 would require planning authorities uh, to set up citizens' panels to assist the appointed person to consider the evidence report. It is not clear uh, what the role and purpose of su such panels would be, uh, and whilst they may have a role to play in some circumstances, uh, they may not in others. By making this a blanket requirement for every evidence report, this could lead to unnecessary delay. Citizens' panels can also be very resource-intensive, having a long lead-in time and can be very costly. And by prescribing a particular method, this also overlooks the need to adopt a range of engagement techniques to reflect the needs and preferences of different stakeholders. Amendment 206 uh, appears to introduce a new requirement for strategic planning for some planning authorities using the evidence report for local development plans, and I have a number of significant issues with this. The evidence report has an important role to play uh, in the new process. Uh, according to this amendment, on top of setting out local evidence, they would have to set out proposals and policies for strategic and cross-boundary issues. 
They would also have to explain how this work is being done, including where, with whom and how it is resourced. I am concerned that this is out of step with the new approach to development planning and we want the evidence reports to be prepared, published and scrutinised early. We want the gate check that follows to be transparent, participative and proportionate. It is important that the ev evidence report is not overloaded. I am not just concerned about overcomplicating the evidence report. This amendment seems to be introducing strategic development planning through the back door, with authorities out with strategic development plan areas being relegated to a second division approach. Two-tier strategic development planning will just make the process more complicated and confusing, and I would ask the committee uh, to reject this amendment. With regard to Amendment 227 uh, relating to play opportunities, uh, I consider the most appropriate place to address this matter would be in policy and guidance rather than on the face of the bill. I've already been clear that we would expect the evidence report to cover infrastructure matters for the plan area. Infrastructure is broad in meaning, but includes green infrastructure, the defin of which, definition of which in the Scottish planning policy includes play spaces. I therefore do not support this amendment. Daniel Johnson's Amendment 196 uh, requires the evidence report to identify the demand for and availability of student housing accommodation. Whilst I wholly agree that housing is a key matter for the evidence report uh, to consider, I do not think it appropriate to include a reference to one specific area of specialist housing here. Um, I've set out the requirements to consider a range of specialist housing and student accommodation is included in that. Officials have been working with a small number of stakeholders to consider how the evidence report could work in practice. I expect that there will be broader interest in this and wider views on what the evidence report should contain. I therefore consider it would be more appropriate for there to be further debate on this uh, when we come to more detailed regulations and guidance. This is provided for within the bill in new section 16A 2B. Um, finally, uh, I will explain amendment 119 in my name, convener. Um, I want to see a statement in the evidence report itself reporting on the steps taken to seek views and engage with people and the extent to which they have been taken into account. Amendment 119 introduces that requirement. It also identifies the need for the statement to specifically address how gypsy travellers and children and young people have been involved. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring gypsy travellers are properly involved in planning in the, in the future of their places, like everyone else. And we also agree with the independent panel that children and young people need to be more actively involved in the future of their places. These focused amendments will address the issues that emerged uh, during stage one and ensure that the evidence report is prepared on the basis of meaningful and inclusive collaboration. I therefore ask the committee to support Amendment 119. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Minister. It's amazing how quickly finally has become my favourite word. Uh, <coughs> Andy, you wanted to speak. Thank you, Convener. Just a few uh, uh, words. Um, I, I agree with the Minister on the the amendments in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. The, the committee, whilst uh, expressing concern that the Ministry's report could reduce opportunities, did go on to say we consider, however, that the new evidence report and gate check provides a mechanism to address these concerns. So, so long as we reject the Ministry's report and put an evidence report in, it seems that a piecemeal approach to put some of the main issues report amendments back in is not appropriate. On Amendment uh, 8, um, I, I have some problems with this. I think it's um, a well-intentioned amendment, um, but the demonstration of viability is a very difficult thing for planning authorities to do when viability can relate to um, issues to do with land ownership, infrastructure, the actions of other parties, uh, etc. So I'd be keen to discuss that with Graham Simpson between now and stage three to see if we can get something uh, improved. But in the meantime, my judgment is it'd be better not to have that in the bill, but I'm very happy to have something that is uh, similar to it at the end. On Daniel Johnson's well, amendment... Yep. Yeah. 
Uh, can I thank Andy Whiteman and, and indeed the Minister uh, for the comments on, on, on this amendment uh, and I've reflected on them uh, while you've been speaking. Uh, I will take up the Minister's offer uh, of discussions uh, on this uh, and I'll not be moving this particular amendment. Okay. Uh, thank thank Graham Simpson for his amendment, his intervention. Um, on 196, Daniel Johnson on student uh, housing. Um, I think this is a very, very important issue. Um, I do think it's appropriate uh, for this to be addressed um, in the bill. However, I don't think the wording is correct. I mean, instead of student housing accommodation, it might be better that it's housing accommodation for students, that we make it clear that it's further in higher education students and not students in primary and secondary education. Um, but I'm happy to support that, get that in the bill on the basis that um, uh, the member uh, agrees to, to, to have some further discussions about the wording. On Monica Lennon's 226, we're in a kind of difficult place here because we, I, I think there are still discussions to be had about what we do about strategic development plans. Um, as uh, I think I argued last week or the week before, um, we're not persuaded that we should have got rid of them, but neither are we persuaded uh, that they're the best solution to strategic development planning. Um, so whilst this would introduce a sort of twin track and it's perhaps not in the best place, I think I, I will be supporting this on the basis that I want to have this conversation, wanna, we must have this conversation between now and stage three to, 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 to thrash out what we are doing about strategic development planning. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, any other member wants to comment? Right. In that case, I ask Alec Cole Hamilton to wind up. Thank you, convener. Um, both the Minister and Andy Whiteman referred to my attempts to preserve the main issues report as piecemeal, and actually I like to think of it more as surgical rather than nuclear. I think the alternative would have been to remove the entire section. I think there is still a, a, an important point here to be made about consultation of communities, so I'm going to, I'm going to press this amendment in the hope of going down 7-0 again, but there you go. Thank you very much. And I admire your confidence. The, okay, the question therefore is that Amendment 193 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The amendment falls. Sorry, yeah, okay. Uh, anybody? No. no? Everybody's opposed to it. Thank you. Right. Just a show of hands, please. Just for the show of hands. Right, no. okay. Okay. <laughs> He's, I, 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 I want for the record that this wasn't my suggestion that we keep on rubbing this into you. But, right. Okay. The the amendment therefore has fallen seven nil. Um, I call amendment one nine four in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with amendment seventy four. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. Okay. The question is that amendment one nine four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? The amendment is agreed to. I call amendment 118 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 74. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. I call amendment 118A in the name of Monica Lennon already debated with amendment 74. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 118A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The amendment is agreed to. The Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 118. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 118 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed to 7 0. Is there anybody who's opposed? Acclamation. Uh, about acclamation. Okay. Right. Now we've got a new phrase. Uh, I call Amendment 8 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 193. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 76 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 193. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Agreed by acclamation. Yeah, I call Amendment 195 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 193. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 195 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The amendment is agreed. Four, three. Okay. I call amendment 196 in the name of Daniel Johnson. Already debated with amendment 193. Daniel Johnson to move or not move? Move. Okay. The question is that amendment 196 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The amendment is agreed to. 
And I call Amendment 119 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 193. Minister, to move formally. Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, agreed by acclamation. I call Amendment 120 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 193. Graham Simpson, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 120 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, again, agreed by acclamation. Call, call Amendment 197 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 74. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 198 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 74. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 198 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The Amendment 198 is agreed to. Yeah. I call Amendment 226 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 193. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 226 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The Amendment 226 is agreed to. Four, three. I call Amendment 199 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 193. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Uh, not move, and I won't be moving 203 either, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. I call Amendment 200 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 193. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 121 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 74. Minister, to move formally. Moved, convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 121 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed by acclamation. I call Amendment 201 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 74. Graham Simpson, to move or not? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 201 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I agreed by acclamation. I call Amendment 227 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 193. Monica Lennon to move or not? Move. The question is that Amendment 227 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour, 227? Four. Those opposed? Three. Amendment 227 is agreed to. Four, three. Call Amendment 202 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 74. Monica Lennon to move or not? Move. Move. The question is that Amendment 202 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. 202 is agreed. Four, three. The question... They call Amendment 77 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 74. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? The amendment is agreed 4-3. I call Amendment 9 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with amendments shown in the groupings. Graham, to move Amendment 9 and speak to all amendments in the group. Right, bear with me, convener. This is uh, going to be very, very quick, convener, because it's uh, ridiculously simple. Um, uh, amendment 9... Um, uh, really, really, all this does is increases the time frame for representations on a proposed local development plan from 8 to 12 weeks. Uh, this obviously gives public more time to engage with and fully understand the plan. Uh, I would have thought that was uh, what we would all want. Um, that's all I need to say on that one. Thank you very much, then. Minister, to speak to Amendment 122 and other amendments in the group, and please feel free to take Mr Simpson as your example. Thank you, Convener. I might take a little bit longer than Mr Simpson. Um, Mr Simpson's Amendment 9 uh, proposes increasing the period for representations on the proposed plan. Uh, it's uh, currently six weeks. The bill has extended it to eight weeks, uh, and Graham Simpson proposes ex extending it to 12 weeks. Um, I'm content to support this amendment, although on its own it will have limited effect. And I hope that we can all agree that the quality um, of engagement is the most important thing uh, to stimulate community-led engagement and to encourage innovative and creative approaches to involving a wider range of people in the planning process. I hope that planning authorities uh, will use that additional time uh, to deepen engagement rather than just lengthen it. 
Uh, Amendment 127 uh, relates to the participation statement within the development plan scheme. Uh, the needs to prepare a development plan scheme is an existing requirement. It sets out the planning authority's programme for preparing and reviewing their plan. It must include a participation statement that sets out when consultation is likely to take place, with whom it's, it's likely form and the steps to be taken to involve the public at large. My amendment will mean that when a planning authority is preparing their development plan scheme, they first must talk to people about how best how uh, how they can best engage with them. Uh, this will improve the effectiveness of engagement and allow authorities to tailor their approach so that a wider range of people uh, get involved. This is a key part of good practice in engagement, which we would expect planning authorities to follow anyway, but the amendment makes it explicit. I now come to, uh, to amendments 122 to 126 and amendment 153 in my name. Uh, during stage one, uh, the planning bill was described as uh, centralising. I, of course, disagree with that view, convener. However, the committee's views led the Scottish Government to look again at the balance of powers within the legislation and for opportunities to further strengthen local accountability for planning. In doing so, um, I revisited the report of the Independent Planning Review Panel and our subsequent consultation. Whilst the panel proposed removing uh, plan examinations, our consultation showed a great deal of support for the independent scrutiny they provide. We sought to move part of this scrutiny uh, to an earlier stage and introduced the concept of a development plan gate check. The debate at stage one has given us the, uh, an opportunity to explore more radical options that could deliver on the panel's and the committee's aspirations for stronger local ownership and responsibility for local development plans. And as a result, um, I propose these amendments which remove Scottish Minister's ability to intervene in, deve in local development plans at the end of the plan preparation process prior to their adoption. The amendments are a collection of detailed and technical changes, while some remove existing requirements to notify ministers, for example, the changes made by Amendment 124 to remove Section 1912 of the 1997 Act, and some remove ministers' existing abilities to intervene prior to adoption, for example, Amendment 125 and others deal with the consequences of the changes to publication and notification arrangements at the end of the process and ensure that requirements are not duplicated. I will, however, however focus my time today on the reasons for making um, these amendments. Currently, there is a period of 28 days for Scottish ministers to consider the local development plan before it can be adopted by a planning authority. If during this time ministers find the plan to be unsatisfactory, they can direct the authority to consider modifying the plan. These amendments mean that this consideration period will be removed and that following the independent examination of the plan, there will be no intervention in the process by ministers. The bill, as introduced, included measures to ensure that timescales and powers for ministers to make directions were adequate and arrangements were unequivocal. However, in view of the strength of views expressed and to show my commitment to subsidiarity, I have reconsidered this. As the name suggests, these are local development plans. They address local planning matters for local people. They are prepared by local planning officials and adopted by locally elected members. It is therefore appropriate that after a comprehensive process of preparation and independent scrutiny, the ultimate decisions on the local development plan rest with the local authority. These amendments align with wider objectives to streamline streamline and front load the development plan process, as well as to use resources effectively. They will shorten the adoption timescale of a, a local development plan by removing the 28-day consideration period. The Scottish Government regularly receives correspondence calling for ministers to change local development plans at the very end of the process. 
There is no statutory provision for this and the amendments will remove any expectation that changes should be made by ministers after the examination has concluded. The amendments will further support front-loading the planning system and instead of having oversight at the end of the process, we have already proposed enhanced scrutiny at the gate check stage. They will also enable government resources to focus on where they can support the wider process proactively rather than in a reactive way. Uh, time can be redirected to contributing to local development plans at an earlier stage and undertaking engagement and collaborative working to inform the new pl national planning framework. I would therefore encourage you to support these amendments as a sensible approach to preparing plans that leaves the responsibility for local development plans squarely in the hands of local authorities. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Graham Simpson to wind up. Um, thanks, uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I, I have to say I welcome very strongly um, the words of the Minister um, and his amendments, um, which seem to me to bring to this bill uh, less centralisation. I, I realise the Minister doesn't accept that he was being centralising. Um, however, his amendments uh, uh, appear to contradict that, so they are to be uh, welcomed. Uh, he's given a commitment to subsidiarity. Um, that is to be welcomed. Um, no intervention by ministers. That is to be welcomed. Um, this is all going in the direction that the committee uh, wanted the bill to go. Um, so these amendments are, are to be supported um, without a doubt. And I'm glad to hear he's supporting my amendment nine. Thank you very much. And I take it you'll be... Pressing on withdrawing? Yes. Okay. Pressing. The question is Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Right. Passed by acclamation. Call amendments 122, 123, 124, 125, 126, and 127. All in the name of the Minister and all previously debated with Amendment 9. I invite Ministers to move Amendments 122 to 127 on block. Moved on block, Convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 122 to 127? In that case, the question is that amendments 122 to 127 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Passed by acclamation. <coughs> I now call amendments. The question, sorry, the question is that section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. It's agreed. Call amendment 66 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with amendments as shown in the grouping. Andy Whiteman to move amendment 66 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, section 4 of the Bill repeals Section 22 of the 97 Act. Section, 9, section 22 of the 97 Act provides that planning authorities may adopt and issue statutory supplementary guidance in relationship to both strategic development plans and local development plans. As our, the Stage 1 report noted, the Committee remains to be convinced that getting rid of such guidance will simplify local development plans and improve scrutiny and accessibility. A range of planning authorities told us that they found the ability to publish such guidance a useful part of the planning functions, with Edinburgh, for example, highlighting that it enabled them to respond quickly and transparently to changing circumstances. South Lanarkshire, too, highlighted their ability to adopt guidance on things like minerals and off onshore wind. Uh, convener, this is another part of the bill where the status quo may have defects, um, but we are not persuaded they can be resolved by getting rid of the provisions uh, in their uh, entirety. So Amendment 66 deletes Section 4 of the Bill and thus restores the status quo, and I move Amendment 66 uh, in my name. Amendment 67 restores the Strategic Development Plan as part of the Development Plan as defined by Section 24 of the 97 Act. Amendment 68 restores the language of Section 24 of the 97 Act in relation to the, to the approval of the plan by the Planning Authority or Scottish Ministers and in relation to supplementary guidance. Uh, and Amendments 69 and 70 are consequential. Thank you. Uh, Minister, to speak to Amendment 131 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, there are significant issues raised uh, in this group of amendments uh, which could have a dramatic uh, and damaging effect on the reform of our planning system. Um, I'll first of all address Andy Whiteman's uh, Amendment 66, 69 and 70. 
there uh, appears to have been some con confusion among stakeholders uh, about the removal of supplementary guidance. Uh, I would remind the committee uh, that the, the bill is seeking to remove statutory supplementary guidance currently adopted under section 22.1 of the 1997 Act, so that it no longer forms part of the development plan. Authorities um, would still be able to bring forward uh, guidance on matters relating to the planning system as they see fit, uh, but while that guidance uh, may be a material consideration in decision making, it would not form part of the development plan. Uh, there are very good reasons um, for removing statutory supplementary guidance from forming part of the development plan. It is adding to, uh, not reducing, the complexity of development plans. Uh, planning authorities appear to be using it to adopt significant policies that have the full weight of the development plan behind, behind them, uh, but without the rigour, engagement and independent scrutiny that is vital in producing a development plan. So crucially, um, I would question the transparency of statutory supplementary guidance. Uh, the way it is used uh, means that big issues, issues in which developers and communities have a significant interest, have only limited consultation and no independent scrutiny. It also confuses people as key policies can be spread across several individual documents which are published at different times. And we have clear evidence uh, that sub supplementary guidance is being overused. Earlier this year, uh, my officials established that there are at least 342 separate pieces of statutory guidance referred to in development plans across Scotland. Uh, around 12,000 extra pages added to the statutory development plan. The number per authority ranges from zero to 38. Uh, and this length and inconsistency is not helpful. As the independent panel recommended, it would be much easier if all local development plan policies and proposals were in one place. Supplementary guidance generates duplication. At present, many supplementary guidance documents are used to repeat national planning policy. This will not be necessary if the national planning framework incorpor incorporating Scottish planning policy forms part of the development plan. And there are further technical difficulties. Planning authorities have used it to add further policies, either at the time a plan is prepared or afterwards. But when they adopt a new local development plan, all existing supplementary guidance falls, leaving a policy vacuum until they are replaced. Now, I understand that environmental organisations have concerns um, that removing supplementary guidance would result in a loss of environmental policies. I would argue the opposite. Rather than leaving a significant policy, for example, on green space or wind energy to a separate document, these issues would instead be addressed up front in the local development plan. Supplementary guidance adds to the complexity of the planning system and it lacks rigour and transparency. And that is why the bill seeks to remove these provisions. And I would therefore ask the committee to reject Amendments 66, 69 and 70. Turning now to Amendments 67 and 68, I've already set out my concerns about maintaining strategic development plans and I've agreed that we can have further conversation um, on this issue. Um, but for the reasons I, I've explained, uh, we need to remove statutory supplementary guidance in the interests of removing complexity and improving the transparency of development planning. So I must strongly resist the inser insertion of these additional documents into the de definition of the development plan as proposed by these two amendments. Once more, I would ask the um, committee to take the bill as an opportunity uh, to make development plans and the planning system as a whole much simpler and easier for everyone to understand. I cannot support amendments that would not only miss this opportunity 
uh, but would make the system even more complicated than it is now. Finally, I, I turn briefly to the amendments in my own name, convener, which are technical but important to the effectiveness of the system. Amendments 131, 132 and 133 deal with the effective date of provisions of the National Planning Framework and Local Development Plans. This makes it clear that if a provision of one part of the development plan is inconsistent with another, the later provision is to prevail. Uh, this will be of particular relevance where one document is amended at a later date to the other. These new arrangements would help development planning to move forward rather than look back to outdated documents. Amendments 134, 135 and 136 make minor changes to provisions for legal challenge to the National Planning Framework, recognising the provision for it to be amended and the arra arrangements for publication of an amended framework. However, Amendment 133 and Amendments 135 and 136 make reference to sections that would have been inserted by Amendment 116. Since that amendment was not passed, I will not move these amendments today, but I intend to bring forward equivalent amendments at stage three uh, with the appropriate references. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. I'll start. Uh, ask Andy Whiteman to wind up, please. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Convener. Um, I, I've listened very carefully to what the Minister uh, had to say, and I'm, I appreciate um, perhaps um, for the first time putting on record in a, in a rather more clear exposition of the reasons why the bill does what it does. Uh, this is an area, I think, where there was there is some confusion. Um, uh, I think what he said, in my mind, certainly clarifies matters and clarifies the Minister's uh, intentions in this regard. I would still like to have further conversations around this because there is not uniformity of view uh, about this, but in the spirit of goodwill, I will not be pressing amendments uh, 66, 69 and 70. Amendments 67 and 68, um, I will be pressing amendment 67. Uh, it's consistent with the approach that the committee has taken to date in relationship to the retention of strategic development plans, although I'm aware that it contains a provision around supplementary guidance that's not consistent with my not pressing the other ones, but um, given that we're going to have to tidy up strategic development planning and what we're doing, that can be dealt with at stage three. Uh, I will not be pressing Amendment 68. Amendment 69 and 70 come later, and, and frankly, I can't remember in Schedule 2 what they relate to, but we'll deal with that when we get to the vote in several weeks' time. Thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, thank you for that. The and Andy Whiteman has he seeks leaves to withdraw his um, amendment, 66. Does any member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. In that case, the amendment is withdrawn. Um, and the question is that section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. It's a yes by acclamation. I, yes. We, I think this is probably a good place to stop for five minutes or so for a comfort break. So, back as soon as we can, please.
I call Amendment 10 in the name of Graham Simpson and a group on its own, Graham Simpson, to move and speak to Amendment 10. Uh, convener, this, uh, this will be uh, really quick. Um, but, uh, table, amendment 10, uh, table Amendment 10 in the mistaken belief, um, uh, probably because of legalese, uh, my lack of expertise of legalese, that this could apply to named individuals. I'm uh, assured uh, that uh, it does not apply to named individuals uh, and it uh, would merely apply to office holders, so I'll not be moving the amendment. Uh, right, okay. The question is that section five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I call amendment one two eight in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment one eight five. Oh, the question is that section six be agreed to. My apologies, minister. Are we all agreed? I call amendment one two eight in the name of the minister. Already debated with amendment one eight five. Uh, not moved, convener. Thank you. Four one. Yeah, sorry. Four yeah, one. yeah, yeah. I call amendment four one in the name of Graham Simpson. Already debated with amendment one eight five. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. Okay, the question is that amendment forty one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, those in favour? Graham seemed a bit unsure there. Uh, <laughs> Those opposed? The, amen the, the, <laughs> the amendment has been passed 4-3. Uh, I call Amendment 11 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with Amendments 28, 130 and 29. Graham Simpson, move 11 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again, Convener. Uh, speak a bit longer on this one. This is about amending the local development plan. So I'm speaking to uh, one amendment, that's Amendment number 11. Um, uh, and this says that a planning authority must amend a local development plan constituted for their district if it becomes apparent that insufficient supply of land is available for housing. Um, now, it may on the face of it, convene us, that, that may sound a bit top down, um, but it's absolutely vital, especially when we're going to move to a 10 year cycle. Uh, that councils keep uh, de uh, development plans up to date. Um, recent plan examinations have found significant shortfalls in areas like Edinburgh, Fife uh, and Glasgow. My amendment would help to address this, and this is important for councils because um, they, are, they are often challenged uh, on, on, on this area, and I don't want to see that. Um, none of us wants to see that. So I think by um, keeping things up to date, they keep themselves safe. The planning bill must address, it's got to address this issue, uh, the issue of uh, building far too homes. Um, an LDP must be updated in the event of a housing supply shortfall. Uh, this will best uh, support a plan-led system, which we all want, uh, and the role of the LDP in managing sustainable growth and the, and the benefits that flow from it. Um, so it really, uh, is is just about it's about keeping things up to date, um, preventing challenges to councils uh, from from developers. Um, so that's that that explains it. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Daniel Johnson, to move to speak to Amendment Twenty Eight and other amendments in the group. Um, my amendments Twenty Eight and Twenty Nine are, are aimed at a similar fundamental point that Graeme Simpson has outlined in terms of if we're moving to a 10-year cycle, it's vitally important that the local development plan is, is able to be updated. I think that is particularly true when you're talking about uh, large publicly owned sites. And this is uh, drawn from direct experience in my own constituency where we've seen three major sites all within a quick succession of years being put up for sale, the community having to mount large vocal um, campaigns, all seemingly to very little effect. What I think needs to happen is that early consultation must be facilitated so that people have a stake up front prior to sale in the set, uh, when uh, large public uh, sites are sold. And I think this is important for two reasons. One, because we're talking about the scale of the sites. And secondly, 
because when it's publicly owned sites, people feel that they have a stake and ownership. And frankly, these are, we're talking about sites which are very much cherished parts of the community, the development of which can frequently radically change the, the nature and character of a community, which is why I think this is important. And if you look at just one of the examples of the sick kids, if you look at the local plan as it stands, it says it's a hospital. The, the, the brutal bottom line is that people don't expect these large sites to change in terms of their purpose. So that is why this, uh, these amendments um, have been brought forward. What my proposal seeks to do is that when planning authorities become aware of a proposal to sell land, they, they then engage in a consultation process uh, which would seek to update the local development plan. So the plan, given this, this uh, change in circumstances, reflects uh, local uh, need. Furthermore, I, I've sought to uh, clarify and, and uh, state a, a robust consultation process. So not just that consultation that would be required, but that, that consultation would need to be explicitly reflected uh, in the update. And finally, I have sought to, to clarify this in terms of it being a, uh, focused on major sites, which um, uh, draws on uh, the... Uh, town and Country Planning Hierarchy of Development, Scotland Regulations 2009, uh, but obviously adding the public element. Now, I understand in terms of my com conversations I've had informally that there are some concerns as to what uh, would be implied given uh, the, the stipulation in my amendment, subsection 2, uh, uh, pertaining when uh, a local authority becomes aware. Now, I'd just like to draw members' attention to subsection 3, which requires ministers to issue guidance about how uh, public bodies would be required to inform local authorities if they're intending to sell that site. Now, what I think that does is avoid the possibility of essentially either through um, uh, 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 circumstance or indeed uh, through uh, intent, uh, public bodies may uh, uh, conceal uh, their their intention to, to, to sell so that they can obtain planning permission before the update of a plan. I think the, the requirement for regulations would ensure that we have a process that, that prevents that. Likewise, um, the, 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 the specific uh, requirements in terms of the consultation update, again, uh, I put uh, 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 in uh, uh, my amendments uh, the requirement for ministers to issue specific guidance around that so that the, the um, uh, specific and technical requirements can be thought more clearly and I would just like to point out to uh, members that I have also in uh, 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 Amendment 29 stipulated that it should be by affirmative procedure uh, because I do think that the nature of how both of these elements are conducted um, <laughs> is of vital importance. Uh, finally, I'd just like to conclude by saying development of large publicly owned sites is hugely controversial. I think um, this amendment is important in principle. I think it would have hugely beneficial practical impacts. I would also like to point out, I think having a strong definition of consultation in this bill would be useful uh, and potentially useful elsewhere. Um, I, I move uh, the amendments in my name. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Minister, would you like to speak to Amendment 130 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, first of all, with uh, regard to Graham Simpson's Amendment 11, um, I would agree with the aim uh, of this amendment and expect to bring forward guidance uh, which will explain in more detail the range of circum circumstances that could trigger uh, a review of a local development plan. Uh, our working groups discussed this and suggestions included a significant change uh, in local economic circumstances, uh, a shortfall in the number of homes being delivered, or where uh, a local plan uh, em emerges. Uh, this was set out in our technical paper in December 2017. However, I believe it would be more useful to look at these triggers uh, in the round. Uh, rather than to elevate one over all of the others. In particular, I believe Amendment 11 uh, could lead to perpetual review of local development plans where the matter of housing land is in dispute and review is required in every case. Uh, planning authorities could easily be caught up in continually, continually justifying uh, their land supply uh, if plan amendments were to be required in all cases as a matter of law. Rather, it's important that local authorities are able to use their judgment 
and consider the evidence more fully in determining when the time is right uh, to bring forward uh, plan amendments. Um, with regard to Amendment 28, I should say, first of all, um, that members should realise that planning can't stop or delay sites being sold. And I'm not convinced that Amendment 28 um, covers a planning issue. Public sites may change ownership without generating uh, a planning issue. Uh, like many other amendments we have discussed today, um, this would add significant administrative duties to planning authorities without necessarily having any relevance to the question of future development. Where change of use that constitute development arises, the public body would need to engage with planning when they submit a planning application and meet any associated requirements for consultation at that stage. In any case, uh, local authorities must be able to use their judgment uh, and consider the evidence more fully in determining when the time is right to bring forward plan amendments in their areas. Setting out the triggers and guidance for reviewing local development plans uh, would allow for further consultation uh, with stakeholders uh, on the different circumstances that are relevant and how they are defined. It would also enable us to revisit and update these circumstances if practice requires. I therefore ask the committee uh, not to support the amendments in this group. Amendment 130 of my own was consequential on Amendment 116, which was not agreed, so I'll not be moving uh, Amendment 130, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got two members who would like to make a brief intervention. Uh, Monica Lennon and Andy Wynton. Thank you, Convener. I um, just wanted to clarify some earlier remarks that I made because I, I think I, I got ahead of myself. I mentioned in the earlier session on um, main issues in evidence report um, one of Graeme Simpson's amendments. Um, number eight, and I talked about some of the language around apparent. I was actually thinking about um, number 11, which is in front of us um, just now. So I think the discussion we've just heard, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm supportive of it in principle of this, but I think um, the guidance would be important because I think we'd have to be clear what, what should trigger. Because if we're asking the planning authority to, to do something so they must amend, I think we'd have to be really clear um, about the, the criteria um, that, that, that we have um, in mind. Daniel Johnson's amendment number 28, um, um, I, I, I do support that. Um, and I think with these um, major um, sites that come forward, particularly where they are um, in public ownership, um, thinking about hospitals in particular, um, I know that's a, a topical issue just now in, in, in Lanarkshire. Um, so I think Daniel's made quite a good case for, for his um, amendment. I think in general, in terms of the, the, the lifetime of these local development plans, because 10 years it can be very short, but it can also can be quite a long time. And I know that, that the minister... Um, is very keen to keep local place plans in the bill as well. Um, and we've asked these questions before about what would happen in an area if um, you know a number of local place plans come forward. What does that mean for the local development plan? And, and could that also trigger an update to the plan? So I think we've got some wider issues still to consider. Um, so in terms of Amendment 11, um, I do accept the, the principle, uh, but I think we do need some further clarification um, on what exactly we're asking planning authorities to take responsibility for. Okay, thank you. Andy? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Amendment 11, I, 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 I do understand the sentiments behind this, but I really am rather concerned about getting something into legislation um, at this stage that talks about apparent and insufficient supply. This is wide open to interpretation uh, and dispute and triggers an amendment of the local development plan on that basis. I'd be very happy to talk to the member about how, and indeed the minister, about how we might do this, but I, I feel uncomfortable supporting it at this stage. On Daniel Johnson's Amendment 28, um, I support the spirit behind this. I think we do have large sites that are not anticipated to be um, changing in, in any way, and then suddenly they do, and, and often there's, um, it would be appropriate to have a more kind of fundamental look at how that land should be used uh, in the future. However, as the, as the Minister has said, this does engage questions about um, considering proposals where planning authorities become aware that bodies are intending um, or considering a proposal for sale 
uh, and that's got nothing whatsoever to do with the planning system. It, the regulations that are also proposed uh, would not cover big public authorities like the Ministry of Defence, uh, not being a Scottish public authority, and yet the Ministry of Defence, as we know, have got a, a programme of land disposal, some of them very, very large, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Lothian and other parts of, of Scotland. There's also potential conflict because there's no provision made as to what happens if um, the owner of one of these sites, or indeed anybody, submits a planning application under the existing local development plan, um, how one would retrospectively amend the plan. That, there's there's, a, there's a not really a good um, fit there. So I do think we need to do something in this area, and I commend Daniel Johnson for the work he's undertaken. I think a lot of this could um, form part of an amendment at stage three, but I'm just um, not minded to support it at this stage because I do think it needs some substantial work and that's better done from a blank sheet than from the amendment of a large um, amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Graham Simpson to wind up and press or withdraw, please. Um, yes, uh, th thank you very much. Um, uh, well, once again, um, I've reflected on what, what people have said, um, uh, particularly the, the, the Minister on, on Amendment 11. Um, he seems to accept the, the, the principle behind the amendment, um, but believes it would be better dealt with uh, in guidance. Uh, and I think he's probably right on that. Uh, convener, uh, there are words uh, in in the amendment which are which are open to interpretation. The word apparent, uh, the word insufficient. Um, how do you how do you prove either? Uh, and I'm someone who likes uh, precision in language, uh, and I'm afraid this isn't uh, all that precise. So I'll not be moving that amendment, but I do welcome uh, the minister's commitment to having further discussions. On Daniel uh, Johnson's uh, Amendment uh, 28, I'm also, um, I see where he's coming from, uh, but I tend to agree with the Minister on this. It's not, it's not for planning, but uh, I think he should uh, perhaps revisit it uh, for, for Stage 3 and, and have discussions with people. Thank you very much. You did uh, officially move it earlier, so you, you're now seeking to withdraw it? I will withdraw it. Right, thank you very much. So, there for, for uh, Graham Simpson seeks leave to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? Okay, thank you. The amendment is therefore withdrawn, and I call amendments 55 in the name of Alexander Stewart. Group with amendments as shown in the groupings. I would point out the following preemptions. Amendment 56 is preempted by Amendment 93 in Group Simplified Developments Zones Procedure. Amendment 57 is preempted by Amendment 95 in Group Simplified Development Zones Procedure. Uh, amendment 150 preempts Amendment 62 and 63 in this group. So I hope you've all got that. Uh, Alexander Stewart to move Amendment 55 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. I'm happy to move Amendment 55 and speak to the other amendments within the group. Uh, 55, this provides that Scottish ministers make a, di a direct planning authority to exercise their power to amend a local development plan for their districts in relation to the matter specific with the direction. The bill does not currently include a requirement for a publication of directions given by Scottish ministers to the planning authority under this section. The amendment inserts the requirement of the publication to be given. Uh, and by inserting this requirement, it ensures that the publication is uh, increased accountability uh, and the di direction taken by Scottish ministers. In Amendment 56, the section contains uh, specified in development zones themselves. Uh, under the provision, Scottish ministers may at any time direct a planning authority to make a scheme or to alter a scheme in such terms as Scottish ministers consider appropriate. This amendment inserts uh, the requirement for the publication. As per 55, it would increase uh, accountability. 57, under the provision of the Scottish ministers, it gives a calling in direction uh, to the planning authority in relation to the authority's proposal for making an alternative scheme. As per 55 and 56, once again, uh, this would introduce increased accountability. 61, the section concerns powers for transfer functions from a planning authority who are unable to exercise their functions 
as a result of prohibition under Section 24.1. Under the provisions, Scottish Ministers may issue a direction allowing for the functions of a planning authority to be exercised by another planning authority or by Scottish Ministers on the planning authority's behalf. As per Amendment 55 to 57, it will increase accountability. This is arguably particularly significant as functions can be transferred by a direction given by Scottish Ministers to Scottish Ministers themselves. 62, the section concerns amendment in respect of performance planning authorities' functions. Uh, directions can be issued in certain circumstances that planning authorities by Scottish Ministers require the authority to take such action as is specified in the direction concerning recommendations for a performance assessment report by Scottish Ministers, and they may vary or revoke such directions. This amendment clarifies uh, the situation uh, and it must be in writing. The requirements for the decision to be in writing ensures that publications can take place in written form, while the amendment provides some degree of flexibility uh, by leaving the decisions uh, and the direction of the manner in which the Scottish Ministers may wish to travel. Uh, 62 uh, follows on, so we're on to 63. This amendment clarifies that the direction, verification or revocation of the direction under the section must be published as soon as reasonably practical after it is given. To this will help the publication and in timely, and that will direction having been taken, therefore allowing scrutiny of the decisions and the direction at an appropriate time. Uh, I move the amendments in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minister to speak to Amendment 148 and other amendments in the group. Uh, Thank you, Convener. Um, this group of amendments responds to the request from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, that there should be a statutory requirement for ministerial directions to be published and to include the reasons for making the di direction. Uh, the committee limited itself to addressing new direction-making powers introduced by the Bill. However, there are other direction-making powers already in the 1997 Act, uh, and I feel it is more appropriate uh, that they should all be handled in the same way. Uh, Amendment 151 therefore inserts a provision that applies to all directions made under the 1997 Act. It requires the Scottish ministers uh, to publish the direction and their reasons for making it and clarifies that publication is to include uh, by electronic means. Amendments 148, 149 and 150 tidy up some other parts of the Act to make sure the requirements are all consistent. Uh, I should explain the exception to the requirement relating to Section 265A. Uh, that allows Sc the Scottish Ministers or the Secretary of State to direct that evidence in a planning in inquiry may only be heard or inspected by specified persons if it relates to national security or the security arrangements for any premises or property and disclosing it in a public inquiry would be contrary to the national interest. It follows that the direction describing such evidence should not be required to be published. Um, I appreciate Alexander Stewart's efforts uh, to implement the Delegated Powers Committee proposal. However, um, I would suggest that the uh, amendments in my name are, are a little more comprehensive. And I hope that he will not pre press Amendment 55 and not move his other amendments in this group. And I would ask the committee to accept the amendments in my name. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander Stewart to wind up. Thank you, Convener. And I thank the, the Minister for his comments. Uh, I, I note what, uh, what you are saying, Minister, and I think that you maybe do have some valid points in the process. Uh, therefore, Convener, I would not press. Right. Alexander Stewart seeks leave to withdraw his amendment. Does any member present object to this amendment being withdrawn? No. Thank you. The amendment has been withdrawn. Uh, do, do. I call amendment 177 in the name of the minister grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move 177, speak up to all the amendments. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. And if you just give me a few seconds, because I'm a bit behind in the old paperwork here. Um, thank you, Convener. The bill is introduced uh, would have required planning authorities 
uh, to have regard to local place plans when preparing or amending local development plans in line with the commitment I made at stage one, amendments 129, 177, 137 and 138 uh, will replace the requirement to have regard to local place plans with a requirement to take them into account. Uh, my commitment to bring forward such amendments uh, was welcomed by the committee in its stage one report. And so I trust the committee will welcome these amendments at this stage too. I also committed at stage one uh, to consider amendments which would help clarify our expectations of planning authorities in dealing uh, with local place plans. Concern was raised that the bill as introduced would not require a planning authority to respond in any way when a local place plan was submitted. Amendment 139 is intended to address that concern. The amendment requires planning authorities to maintain a register of local place plans and when a valid local place plan is submitted to it, a planning authority must place the plan on the register and tell the community body it has been registered. If the planning authority considers the local place plan is not valid and so does not register it, the authority must advise the community body of their reasons. This will give community bodies the information they need to correct any problems in order to get an invalid proposal up to standard. <coughs> Excuse me. The Scottish ministers will have powers by regulations to make further provision about the register of local place plans. This includes power to prescribe the form and content of the register. The regulations can also provide for when a local place plan may or must be removed uh, from the uh, register. Uh, the regulations can also provide for when a local place plan, uh, sorry convener, um, I beg your pardon. I'll repeat that again. The regulations can also provide for when a local place plan may or must be removed from the register, allowing for them to expire. Otherwise, they would continue in effect indefinitely, even after the same community body had prepared a new plan. Uh, providing a register of local place plans for a local authority area with a map of the areas the plan cover may also assist community bodies in defining the boundaries of their local place plans so they don't overlap and provide potential developers with a, a source of information on the community's aspirations for its future development. Amendments 178, 179 and 180 are technical adjustments made in consequence of Amendment 139 adjustments. I can see that Mr Simpson's Amendment 78 has similar aims in terms of linking planning authorities uh, to the preparation of local place plans. I agree that it would be helpful when a planning authority is starting to pre prepare its local development plan to let communities know when local place plans would need to be ready in order to be included. Likewise, information on the assistance available to communities from planning authorities should be widely advertised. As drafted, I'm concerned that this amendment could imply local authorities should actively steer uh, the preparation of local place plans and set criteria and deadlines for them. Our intention is that communities lead the development uh, of local place plans, working with rather than to local authorities. And I agree that local authorities could uh, and probably should prioritise areas for supporting local place plans, but communities in other areas should still be able to bring forward their plans if they want to, in their own way and in their own time. Convener, I will support Amendment 78, uh, but, but would want to look carefully at the wording before Stage 3 to ensure that communities themselves retain that preeminent role. And I'm more than happy uh, to have further conversations uh, with Mr Simpson and others around about that. Um, I now turn to Ms Lennon's amendments 204, 205 and 206. I believe that these must understand the role of local place plans. They are not simply a request to amend the local development plan. They will be rec a recognised expression of a community's own ambition for its place and will have the status of uh, material considerations in the planning system, even before they're considered for inclusion in the local development plan. 
Amendment 204 uh, would prevent communities bringing forward local place plans until at least five years after the local development plan is adopted. Since there is no restriction on when local development plans can be amended for other reasons, I see no justification for limiting communities in this way. Communities already prepare things that look a lot like local place plans, and they do so when something inspires them. That plan should not have to sit on a shelf uh, for five years before it can be recognised. Reflecting the local development plan and its vision will be an important element of the preparation of a local place plan. However, the bill already requires them to have regards to the local development plan. I'm not convinced that a separate requirement to set out why it should be amended is helpful. Local councillors may act as important intermediaries for community bodies as they seek to prepare or garner support uh, for their local place plans. But again, it is the community's plan, and I don't believe that the views of councillors should have such a prominent status in that process. Finally, I turn to Amendment 87. Um, I'm a bit disappointed that Mr Whiteman has brought forward this amendment. In its Stage 1 report, the committee welcomed the statutory underpinning of local place plans as proposed in the bill. I'll not rehearse the full debate on local place plans, but I would like to remind the committee of their intended benefits. The provisions were introduced to ensure that the plans which communities were already preparing could have a statutory underpinning. Uh, there has been widespread support for this with many communities and individuals supporting the independent panel's original recommendation. The independent panel were of the view that this could make a big difference uh, in the way in which people engage with the planning system. I agree that local place plans could play a significant role in not just front-loading engagement, but in securing full and positive involvement in planning from a wider range of people um, that currently engage and, of course, at an earlier stage than, in, in, than is currently the case. We have brought forward other measures to improve engagement in development planning, However, local place plans perhaps have the greatest potential to bring the planning system in step with community empowerment in Scotland. Uh, there is a need for planning authorities to change the way they engage with their communities. Local place plans will provide the maximum opportunity for people to put forward their own ideas for planning, rather than simply responding to proposals put forward by planning authorities. We are all aware of communities which have already led the preparation of plans, setting out the vision for their areas. I met a number of them over the summer, and they have shown great creativity and skills in doing so. Others will need more help, and I recognise that local place plans should provide opportunities for all communities, not just those who already have access to skills and resources. I remain convinced that communities should be able to bring forward uh, a vision for the development of their areas uh, and for those to be taken seriously by planning authorities. This chimes with other work in community empowerment. Uh, listening to communities should be the norm in all public bodies. I would urge the committee uh, not to support Mr Whiteman's amendment and I uh, move Amendment 177. Thank, thank you, Minister. Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 204 and other amendments. And, oh, sorry, my apologies. Graham Simpson, I completely missed you out, Graham, my apologies. Graham Simpson to speak to Amendment 78 and other amendments in the group. Thanks, Convener. It can, can be hard to keep up with this process, um, but uh, let's deal with Amendment uh, 78. Uh, and I'll say at the outset that um, I do uh, welcome the, the, the Minister's support uh, for this amendment. Um, the, co the committee spent a good deal of time looking at local place plans, um, and I think we're, it's fair to say that we were unanimous that they, they could be a good idea, but not enough thought had been given to how, how they could work uh, in, in practice. Um, communities can produce plans for their areas that councils should 
quote, have regard to, which means they could have regard to them and then quickly disregard them. Even the alternative wording where councils must take account of those plans is, is little better. And the worry for the committee is that people could spend a lot of time and money producing plans for their area that ultimately go nowhere. Um, we heard evidence during a visit to Lynn Lithgow that plans can be produced which are then disregarded by a council. That's the council's right, of course. Um, it's for the democratically elected body to make the final decision, but why raise people's hopes? Um, my amendment 78 convener actually replicates a recommendation of, of the committee. Um, and once again, uh, it was designed to uh, uh, enhance uh, community engagement, and that's, uh, that's what the intention is behind it. Now, uh, Andy Whiteman, he'll speak to his own amendment. He, he wishes to see this section removed uh, entirely, um, and I could easily have supported that view, but given that the minister um, is, is prepared to uh, engage uh, on improving the, you know, this idea, then I, I, I would be uh, prepared not, not to support Mr. Whiteman. Um, if the minister's uh, happy to support my amendment, uh, I won't support Mr. Mike Whiteman because I do think there are some legs in this idea. I think we can improve. We can improve it. Uh, we need to improve it. Uh, we do need to have more detailed discussions uh, ahead of stage three because if we want people involved in the planning system. We have to mean it. We have to be serious about it. This could be a good idea, but it's not there yet. It does need some work. Uh, so, as I say, I appreciate the, uh, the, the comments around my own amendment. Um, hopefully that will go through, uh, and uh, I won't support Mr Whiteman's on this occasion. OK, thank you. And this time, Monica Lennon, to speak to Amendment 204 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, um, convener. Um, I think on local police plans, we get into some fundamental issues again about why we, we have this bill in, in the first place. So the minister mm -hmm. talked about um, my amendments 205, sorry, 204, 205 and 206. And I think the minister said that he felt that local police plans had been misunderstood. Um, so just to be clear, uh, minister, it's not that that I or others misunderstand them, but I think there's lots of contradictions um, coming from the government in terms of the bill. So on the one hand, we've agreed there needs to be a purpose for planning, although members have different views about what that purpose should reflect. Um, I've strongly argued for a, a rights-based approach to planning and a real focus on outcomes. We have to be clear about why we're bothering to plan in the first place. And key to all of that is a commitment to a plan-led system. And I know the Minister talks a lot about front-loading and that early engagement and making sure that all parts of the community can have a stake in the development plan. And that's what I think we're all trying to get to with this bill. So then that brings us on to local place plans, which is obviously a, a new uh, proposition. And what would the role of local place plans be? So that's why I'm at the place where I support Andy Whiteman's amendment, number 87, which is about taking these local place plans out of the bill. And it's not because I don't want the community to be involved. I've just argued for people to have more rights, including children, young people, disabled people through access panels and community councils, all proposals which the minister has argued against and uh, members of this, some members of this committee have, have voted against. Um, so all the evidence that we heard throughout stage one, well, if you just um, bear with me, all the evidence that, that we heard, because I know some members have just joined us a, a couple of uh, sessions ago, a couple of days or weeks ago, um, we, we went outside of Parliament, you know, we went to a full day conference, we went around different parts of the country, and we had um, very long evidence panels here, where we heard people's aspiration to get involved, but they want to be involved in the development plan, they don't want to have to have a parallel process where there's a community second chance at updating the development plan. So we know there's obviously a lot of financial pressure within local authorities. Um, I know that in the financial memorandum, 
government set out what these local police plans would cost. I think Royal Town Planning Institute Scotland felt that might be quite a conservative estimate. Um, I probably should remain committed yes. that I'm a member of the Royal Town uh, Planning Institute. So I hope that all my years of professional experience haven't been wasted and that, that I don't misunderstand what the what the Minister is, is saying. But um, these local place plans, so the, the amendments that I've put forward, you know, and with Andy Whiteman on this, I'm, I'm not convinced, and I think the bill could, could live without them, because I think we all want to focus on getting development plans right. But if we're going to have them, I think we have to do it in a proportionate way, and that's what 204, 205 and 206 are about. So 204, I think we have to look about timescales, because we could have a local development plan freshly adopted, and then just five minutes later, or six months later, or a year later, a proposal for a local place plan emerges. So on the one hand, I think what the Minister is arguing for in this bill is that we streamline planning, that we give certainty to everyone, but in particular to developers and investors um, who you know, want to um, sort of have a good handle on, on risk to development. So I think if we're going to have local place plans, bringing them forward at the, the midpoint in the 10-year um, local development plan, I think that would be that would be reasonable. Um, 205, where I'm saying that we should set out reasons um, for saying why the, the LDP should be amended. Again, I think that's quite sensible. I think people need to, to be able to, to follow and have that understanding. And I think that chimes with some earlier things that we've talked about in terms of Graeme Simpson's amendments. If we're going to talk about um, there not being an effective or um, a sufficient supply of, of housing land, that could be a, a, a trigger for amending. But again, you're setting out a reason. We need to be clear parameters. And I have to say, that these local place plans, if they come forward, they're going to come forward at a very local level. They're going to be neighbourhood-based. They're going to be sort of ward level. And I think the role of local councillors is absolutely fundamental. It's not about giving local councillors, I think the, the word the minister used was prominence, but it's about making sure that there is that proper engagement um, with local councillors, because they won't all sit on, on planning committees. Um, I'll let Annabelle Ewing come in at this point, so I can refer, refer back to my notes. <laughs> uh, yes, oh, thank you. Uh, just two uh, points. On the issue of local place plans, I mean, obviously what uh, the government is seeking to do is to front load community engagement. I personally think that is a good thing, and so I'll be happy to support uh, the amendment. Um, just a point that the member raised a moment ago, uh, to be fair, I thought that was a slight mischaracterisation of, of what the Minister has been saying um, and how, indeed, some members of the committee have voted. Uh, Monica had her own amendments on looking at the involvement of young people and so on. Uh, the Minister had a different approach. I felt that the Minister's approach was a better one, including from a drafting perspective, and I was very happy to support it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Annabelle, for, for your comments. I think just to, to go back, I mean, I, I, I'm still unconvinced, and I have been all throughout... Um, the assessment of the, the the bill. One of the things that I wanted to pick up on, and I've, I've lost my place again. Um, yeah, I think if we want to strengthen the development plan, which I know the minister does, I, I just don't fully understand um, the, the role of, of local place plans in that. I know, for example, the strong opinion in communities to reform other parts of the planning process, like appeals, and we'll come to that at a later stage. And some of the amendments that I've brought forward in, in that regard are very much tied to the development plan. So that's about um, not just allowing people to go off on a tangent and bring things forward that don't comply with the development plan and putting in those checks and balances. So I know the Minister's not keen on that approach, but you know, having these local place plans come in at any moment in that 10-year cycle, I don't think that really allows things to bed in either. Um, so I do remain um, unconvinced. I, I do have some concerns about the, the resourcing of local place plans, um, because maybe the Minister can remind me about the, the projected costs, but we're talking about tens of thousands of pounds. Um, I'm just not sure if that's the best use of resources when there's a lot more we can do to make sure that communities genuinely do get involved at the local development plan um, process um, and can be involved and empowered to have a voice when, when the plan does need to be reviewed. But I think there have to be quite clear 
triggers because I think we could have a very crowded landscape of local police plans coming forward um, and I'm not sure that planning authorities are going to have the resources and the time and effort to respond to them in the most positive way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Wyman to speak to Amendment 87 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thanks, Convener. Section 9 of the Bill provides that community bodies as defined have a statutory right to prepare local development, local place plans, um, and that planning authorities must uh, have regard or take account of them. Um, in our Stage 1 report, we concluded that as things stand, I quote, as things stand, the proposals for local place plans run the risk of being disregarded or ineffective. Now, uh, there are mixed views amongst those who provided both written and oral evidence, with a common concern being uh, the risk that the time and effort spent on engagement with local place plan creation might be better spent on engaging in the local development plan processing process. Now, some amendments that have been tabled, and I include the ones uh, in this group, um, to enhance local place plans, uh, you know, I have no ob objection uh, uh, to. But I, I, do, I do remain of the view that the case has not been made that these are a robust and meaningful contribution to the development planning process. And my Amendment 87, therefore, deletes Section 9 uh, of the Bill. And now, if further work can be done before Stage 3, then, that addresses the concerns expressed by the Committee um, and by myself and, and others, then I'm open to considering supporting uh, the proposal. I feel rather uncomfortable proposing that we remove a provision intended to engage local people in the planning system, but I do not think that we should be proceeding with a provision if, they, if, if, if it does not provide genuine, meaningful uh, process for people as part of the planning system. I, I reject the notion that we should do what England has done and make them a formal part. I agree with the Minister uh, on that. I think in correspondence to the committee, he highlighted uh, that point. But I'm not persuaded at this point that local place plans could make a, a meaningful contribution, given the, uh, the, the task that is in front of communities, given the fact that many disadvantaged communities will be in most need of effective planning, and but le least able um, to deliver um, these. And finally, on Monica Lennon's amendments 204, um, I mean, this, this, this is part of the confusion about this. What are we trying to do with this? I have some sympathy with a bit of certainty, but if they are to be loose things, um, then leave them loose. So I'm not minded to support 204, but I'm content to support uh, 205. Uh, and two six. Thanks, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. To wind up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, can I start off um, with the comments that were um, made by Mr. Simpson and his amendment, um, convener? I recognise the concerns uh, that Mr. Simpson had with local place plans being prepared and not going anywhere. Um, you know, he described current situations. We should uh, note that it's, there's no current place for local place plans um, in the system. Uh, and that, of course, colours some folks' experiences um, of what goes on at present. Um, I hope that the committee um, will appreciate the amendments that I brought forward uh, to make sure that there is a clear place for local place plans and a procedure for local authorities to deal with them. I've made it no secret, um, convener, um, that I want as many folk involved in planning as possible. Uh, and I've talked at length at various points um, of uh, trying to intertwine community planning and spatial planning, because community planning in many areas of Scotland has many, many people involved. And I want to see uh, that level of involvement uh, in uh, spatial planning. And I don't think, um, with the best will in the world, um, that there are going to be a huge amount of folk uh, clamouring to get involved uh, necessarily in development planning um, because they are interested in their own place. And I think that while they might not initially be happy going in to deal with development planning, getting involved in a local place plan may move them on those stages. Because again, I want to see as many people um, as possible uh, getting involved at every stage. And I think that local place plans uh, are designed to give a route for communities uh, into the local development plan. And at the moment, 
as we've heard, communities can play, uh, can actually put together plans which go nowhere. And I think what we're doing is designed to deal with that. Um, I, I, I certainly will, Mr Gibson. One of the issues that really concerned the committee, and it's already been touched on, is the fact that there are many communities that don't have the community capacity to do that. And there are others. And so you would only end up with a very patchy kind of situation across Scotland. And that's the real reason why members of the committee have great concerns about this particular... And I, I've talked at uh, the committee convener and at the finance committee around about where I think um, resources should go to help those communities uh, that maybe don't have the skills and the resource um, at this moment in time. Um, and uh, Ms Lennon um, mentioned uh, how much uh, will some of this cost? Well, the Scottish Government is, uh, as I've said previously, uh, prepared to put resources in to support in communities, including through our Mate in Places initiative. Um, we're also working with PAS uh, and the Scottish Centre for Community Development to help inform the future uh, guidance uh, and support for both communities and planning authorities in this regard. And I would hope uh, that planning authorities themselves uh, will put major emphasis uh, in helping those communities that need it most. Uh, and we will uh, look further at that if that is required. As I've said throughout this process, um, convener, uh, local place plans, I think, have a huge potential to engage people in the planning system at the earliest stages, setting out how they want their places to develop and ensuring that it is taken into account in a local development plan. Uh, these are key elements in the reform. These are key elements in getting more people uh, engaged in planning, which I think we all want to see. Uh, just convener. Two points. One uh, that Monica Lennon had raised earlier on, you said, you would, well, she asked for a figure uh, that, that was made available in the financial memorandum. And the other is, c can I get... Uh, Funny, when, just as uh, Kenny Gibson was talking, making his intervention, I was just writing down exactly the same thing. Will there be funding made available to make it easier for communities who would be struggling to take part in these local plans? Convener, we already make funding available, and I am willing to look at that in the future. But as I said at the Finance Committee, local authorities themselves, in terms of the savings that they can make if the system uh, changes the, the way that uh, we envisage, should be putting money into this as well. In terms of the, uh, the figures uh, which uh, were given to the Finance Committee, we estimate that the average cost of a local place plan would be around about £13,000. Um, based on around about 92 local place plans a year, uh, we reckon that would be around about £1.2 million um, per annum. Convener, um, as I've said, this is about getting as many people involved as possible in planning. Um, I recognise um, that uh, you know we maybe still have a bit of work to do in all of this. That is why I'm quite happy to support Mr Simpson's amendment and to have further discussion around about some of the issues that have been raised. But I think it would be very, very sad, um, convener, um, if the committee uh, were uh, to remove this section from the bill. Thank you very much. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 177 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Amendment 177 is agreed to by acclamation. There's going to be a change of official, so we'll suspend very briefly. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 2 in the name of Lewis MacDonald. Welcome, Lewis. Uh, grouped with Amendments 305, 181, 306, 258 and 1. Thank you very much, Convener Anne. I'm delighted that all amendments in this group support the principle of agent of change, which was endorsed by the committee at Stage 1. The question now is to how, to, how best to go beyond the principle uh, and to give it practical effect. The amendments in my name are designed explicitly to provide a clear legal basis for planning authorities to reject uh, development applications which would compromise the operation of existing cultural venues in an unreasonable way. Now, this goes further than the general provision proposed by other amendments in the group, recognising the need for a decisive shift 
in favour of live music venues in particular, uh, many of which have closed uh, due to adverse planning decisions in recent years. This is a, a recent development. In the last 10 years, we've seen the return of uh, residential accommodation and, and people to the centres of our towns and cities. That is in, in itself very welcome, but one unintended consequence of that has been to impact on live music venues and other cultural venues in town and city centres. A third of those uh, across the country have closed in that decade. That is uh, clearly uh, very significant indeed. Now, jurisdictions across uh, Great Britain, the, the, the Welsh Government, the uh, UK Government in relation to England, uh, and also uh, Greater London, have sought to respond to these changes by introducing planning or updating planning guidance. The Minister did the same in Scotland a few months ago, and that's welcome. But the, 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 the fact this bill is before us in this committee today gives an opportunity to go beyond what's happening in England and Wales and for Scotland uh, to give a lead uh, in providing uh, real protection for live music venues in the law itself. Amendment 306 says that planning permission may not be granted if a development would require unreasonable adjustments by an existing cultural venue or if the developer failed to include adequate noise mitigation measures in the development application. In addition, there would be a higher test for applications in or near to areas designated as culturally significant zones as set out in Amendment 305. Here there would be a presumption against residential developer development unless the developer could demonstrate conclusively, could prove that there would be no unreasonable adjustments required by existing cultural venues as a result. So the designation of a culturally significant zone would not only implement the principle of agent of change in relation to new development, uh, it would also introduce a degree of protection for venues against a change of occupier in a neighbouring building. This might be, for example, where a neighbour who enjoys live music is replaced by one who objects to it. As the law stands, that new neighbour's complaints can lead to that venue being closed down, even though the venue was there first. But with designation in this way, that would no longer be the case. Amendment 2, Convener, is a consequential amendment enabling culturally significant zones to be taken into account in the preparation of development plans. Amendment 258 would make the Music Venues Trust a statutory consultee on the same basis as the Theatres Trust, which is entitled to comment on any planning application which would affect an existing theatre. And this would acknowledge for the first time the cultural significance of live music venues on a par uh, with other cultural venues, uh, and, 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 and therefore I think is significant. <clears throat> now, the other amendments, uh, both Adam Tompkins Amendment and the Minister's Amendment, uh, introduce general provisions, general duties, uh, and uh, uh, Adam Tompkins Amendment goes further in defining development close to live music venues and other sources of noise as noise-sensitive development and prohibits planning authorities from imposing requirements on the noise source as part of a grant of planning permission to the development. Therefore, I think it's stronger than the amendment in the name of the Minister. Uh, but in, in any case, both would be eclipsed in relation to existing cultural venues by Amendment 306 and in relation to culturally significant zones by Amendment 305. Uh, because they have a wider application, they would still have effect if passed alongside the amendments uh, in my name. And therefore, it's perfectly possible to vote for my amendments along with one or, or indeed both of the other amendments in this group, and I, uh, I would encourage committee members so to do. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, you wish to speak to... Uh, convener, one, one. Um, thank you. Um, we need to protect and encourage uh, the significant cultural and economic contribution to our society from the music industry. Um, we have a, a proud history uh, of producing uh, fabulous performers and great music here in Scotland. Uh, and we must do what we can to support our established and emerging musical talent to continue that tradition. Um, however, one of the things um, which Mr MacDonald said was about people moving house. Planning cannot deal with different people moving into a house uh, who may not have the same opinion of the noise coming from their, the neighbouring venue uh, as their predecessor does. Planning cannot resolve that, and I think we should put that very firmly on the record. Um, let me continue on around about um, requirements to mitigate the impact 
of existing noise from the local area on new development, where it should sit with the developer of that new development. Some very compelling evidence was produced at stage one, uh, and I recognise both the strength of feeling and the clear case to act to support our culture and the benefits of our nighttime economy. Um, the committee um, will recall, as Mr Macdonald has already said, that I announced in February uh, that the government would seek to embed the agent of change principle in the next pl national planning framework. Uh, but to ensure that that was implemented immediately, I also asked the chief planner uh, to write to all authorities asking them to act on it uh, with immediate effect. Amendment 181 um, in my name, complements that commitment and takes it a step further uh, by enshrining the need to thoroughly consider and, where appropriate, to mitigate the impact of noise from existing uses when considering planning permission for new development in its vicinity. Amendment 181 addresses noise sources generally because there are lots of different types of use and development that raise these issues but it explicitly refers to the performance of live music to ensure there is no doubt about the need to protect uh, this great resource um, for future generations. My amendment will enable regulations that will identify types of uses and developments and the circumstances to which the agent of change principle applies. It is important that we do this well and in close consultation uh, with those that it will affect. But crucially, Amendment 181 will place a firm duty on the applicant to provide a statement assessing the possible impacts of noise and a firm duty on planning authorities to take full account of the evidence about noise. If granting planning permission, authorities must be clear in their own minds and explain why, within the terms of the application and decision, the likely noise impact would be acceptable. Amendment 181 will ensure noise issues are taken seriously and that all possible steps can be taken to support development delivery while also protecting our existing uses and businesses, including our highly valued cultural venues. Uh, we have shared my Amendment 181 with the music venue owners and other stakeholders in the music industry, and the feedback has been positive. Um, I certainly welcome uh, Lewis MacDonald and Adam Tompkins also supporting the Agent of Change principle. Um, I am unable to support Adam Tompkins' Amendment number one, or Although, for reasons I've just explained, I do absolutely support the intent of it. However, while the planning system expects appropriate conditions uh, to be attached to a planning permission, conditions uh, cannot require action to be taken by a third party who has no direct link to the development or the site. So, Mr Tompkins' uh, amendment does not change the current position. Um, I cannot give my support to the amendments in this group in the name of Mr Macdonald due to their impact both for the operation of the planning system and for the need for us to maintain that essential mix of uses throughout our town centres that help bring our places to life. It is difficult to see how Amendment 305 on culturally, culturally significant zones would work or where they would be brought forward when our culturally significant sites and venues, appropriately in my opinion, are scattered throughout our towns and cities, contributing to the overall vitality and the local economies of the communities they sit in. I also have concerns through that designating culturally significant zones could lead to a clustering of venues, so disincentivising other uses needed to maintain vibrant communities, especially with the risk of a presumption against some development up to 100 metres beyond that zone. Development plans can all already designate land linked to policy, as already happens for a range of matters, including town centres. 
So planning authorities can already set policies in relation to areas or properties they want to see protected for their cultural significance. Our reforms are about delivering good development and removing unnecessary process from the planning system. Amendments 2 and 305 uh, would serve to add process and uncertainty with no clear purpose or benefit. Mr Macdonald's amendment 258 is, I believe, unnecessary. If a planning application is made for development on land on which there is an existing music venue, then the venue operators themselves will already be notified and they can choose whether or not to involve the music venue's trust. There's also a burden of duty and associated costs placed on statutory consultees in the planning system, which would need to be carefully considered. Other statutory consultees are set out in secondary legislation, um, and this is something that I am more than happy uh, to explore when revising the relevant regulations. Um, I am particularly concerned by Amendment 306, also in the name of Mr Macdonald. It introduces a blanket requirement to refuse planning permission for residential use in certain circumstances. The new Section 37A refers to unreasonable adjustments to the operation of existing cultural venues, facilities or uses. It gives no guide as to what sort of adjustment might be unreasonable or what criteria should be used to assess this. Subsection 2 would in effect create a presumption against the uh, grant of planning permission for residential development within 100 metres of a culturally significant zone. The onus placed on the developer to prove that no unreasonable adjustments would seem to be near impossible to meet given that what is unreasonable in this context, is not described by the amendment and could be taken to mean any adjustment which the operator of the venue may not wish to see. Given that a culturally significant zone can comprise a single building and that a planning authority in terms of the proposed new section 56A4 are required to designate where a valid request is made, this would set up the potential for a series of overlapping areas where there is a presumption of no residential development. We would normally expect a refusal if the impact on new development from existing noise sources would be unacceptable. But that must be a decision for the planning authority to make, taking full and fair account of the development plan and all material considerations. My Amendment 181 respects the role of planning authorities and the planning profession to reach reasoned judgments based on best information rather than tying their hands. It more appropriately and proportionately ensures that issues around the impact of noise are considered effectively before any decision is made on an application for planning permission. I ask the committee uh, to give its support to my Amendment 181 to embed the Agent of Change principle into the planning system. And I ask that uh, you do not support um, the amendments in the names of Mr Macdonald and Mr Tompkins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I let uh, Adam talk to us <coughs> in, can I just say that the Minister, I think, will be delighted to hear this is the last section that we're going to be discussing today, so your voice should be OK. She'd hold out for the rest of the day. It was getting a bit... <coughs> Well, to be fair, I think there will be people applauding all over the world. Um, Adam Tom. Thank you, Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I, I welcome the fact that there appears to be universal cross-party support now for the principle of agent of change. Um, and I agree with uh, Lewis MacDonald when he says that the question now is, is how we deliver that in, in legislation. I think it is imperative that it is delivered in primary legislation and not merely in regulations or in guidance, although, of course, regulations and guidance must be in accord with what primary legislation says about um, agent of change. Um, I also agree uh, very much with and welcome uh, Lewis MacDonald's comments that we can support here, or that members of the committee can support here, all of the opposition amendments, those in my name 
uh, and those in his name. They complement one another. They overlap to some extent, uh, but they, they complement one another. Convener, the agent of change principle um, uh, shifts responsibility, as we've heard, for mitigating the impact of uh, noise from an existing music venue to a developer moving into the area. Uh, and this, as Mr Macdonald has said, has become a particular problem in our city centres at the moment because of the um, uh, uh, regeneration of those city centres as places to live. And I declare an interest as somebody who lived in Glasgow city centre for four and a half years uh, um, and certainly could hear quite a lot of noise um, at, at, at that time. Uh, it means, the principle means, in essence, that those bringing about a change must take responsibility for its impact. It's really as simple as that. And the key point is chronology. Uh, we want to avoid a situation where an existing music venue business finds that as a result of a developer moving into the area, fresh noise mitigation measures must be put in place at the venue's expense. Um, uh, as the law stands at the moment, that's exactly what's happening. Responsibility for managing and mitigating the impact of noise on neighbouring residents and businesses lies with the business or activity that's making the noise, regardless of how long the noise generating business or activity has been operating in the area. And this is causing a crisis um, in the live music industry, in particular in Glasgow at the moment. Uh, as uh, members will know, it is threatening the very existence of King Tut's. Um, it is threatening the existence of the sub club, um, two of the principal live music venues in Glasgow city centre. Just last week, I was at a meeting hosted in Glasgow by the Nighttime Industries Association at which these concerns were raised. Um, KSG Acoustics, who are advising uh, King Tut's and the sub-club with regard to the legal action that they're both having reluctantly to take uh, at the moment, uh, have explained that they support the opposition amendments in this group, but not the government amendment in this group, because the government amendment in this group, they think, doesn't go uh, far enough. Convener, my amendment um, is designed to ensure that the spirit of agent of change, which is to ensure that venues and new developments can co-locate this is in no sense an attempt to restrict the planning system, can be put onto the face of primary legislation in Scots law. And my amendment was primarily lodged, as I think my remarks have made plain, to address concerns from the live music community that the current system is inflicting escalating costs on music venues. But it is deliberately broad in scope so that the underlying principle can apply also uh, in other sectors. The Music Venue Trust um, which gave evidence um, to this committee in its stage one uh, inquiry, um, is supportive um, uh, of all of the opposition amendments in this group, but is not supportive of the Scottish Government's Amendment 181, because in the Music Venue Trust's view, that amendment, Amendment 181, would, could, fail, could fail to deliver the desired policy outcomes. And that is a view which, with respect to the Minister, I share. Um, I do have some concerns about whether all of Lewis uh, Macdonald's amendments are strictly necessary and whether some of them, in some respects, go too far. Amendment 306, in particular, has the potential, I think, to obstruct the planning system by imposing a blanket ban on residential development in town centres where there are cultural venues, or in particular where there are clusters of cultural venues, and I heard what the Minister had to say about that. The starting assumption in Amendment 306, if I've read it correctly, um, is that the application for a new development must must be refused if it is within a cultural um, a zone or within 100 metres of one unless proved otherwise. But I think that's an issue that can be tweaked at stage three. So I would urge members of the committee to support that amendment, notwithstanding those reservations at this point, and we can revisit uh, it between now and stage three with a view to seeing whether we really need to go quite as far as, as, as that particular um, wording. There are, I think, with respect to problems with the Amendment 181 in Mr Stewart's name. The first is that it doesn't do enough to put the principle of agent of change on the face of primary legislation. It relies too much on regulations. And the second is that, you know, as the Music Venue the Trust has said, um, it's not transparent from Amendment 181 how exactly firm duties are to be imposed or placed on developers to provide a noise impact assessment at their own cost. Um, or that the developer should undertake mitigation measures themselves. Um, uh, so that, those are the uh, reservations, I think, that we have about Amendment um, 181. It is still possible, even if Amendment 181 were um, accepted, uh, that it could be used against live music venues such as King Tut's and the Sub Club in the city that I uh, seek to represent. And so for all of those reasons, uh, convener, I would urge members of the committee to support all of the opposition amendments in this group and to reject <coughs> Amendment 181.
Thank you very much. Uh, Lewis MacDonald to wind up. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minister said in opening his remarks that planning cannot deal with a change of neighbour. Well, I think the, I would encourage the Minister to be more ambitious than that. Planning can and should reflect our priorities as a society, our priorities as a parliament, uh, and, and this is an ideal opportunity to demonstrate uh, what our priorities are and to put them into effect. We need to go beyond simply reminding planning authorities of their existing duties or requiring uh, uh, reasons to be laid out in a decision notice. We need to actually seek a change in the culture and the practical experience of music venues over recent years, which is that the planning system is effectively working to close venues down, uh, and therefore we need uh, to put in place adequate provision and protection to ensure that that ceases to happen. The Minister said that music venues trust uh, or music venues operators uh, welcomed Amendment 1081. It's important to say that uh, every step the government has taken, there's been two or three different steps taken in the last six months. All of those are steps in the right direction, but this is an urgent situation and short steps in the right direction are not enough. We need an actual change in the basis uh, of the law and, and, and a change in the basis oh, on Mr. which we go forward. Of course. Um, I'm happy uh, to work with both Mr MacDonald and Mr Tompkins to get some of this uh, right, absolutely right, um, for stage three. Because I do think in some of these amendments there are some real difficulties uh, which could create areas where development uh, would not take place. Um, and I do think um, that that is probably not the intention uh, but that is what is laid out in the um, uh, amendment put forward by um, Mr MacDonald. I would reiterate what I said previously. I understand um, the difficulties that there are um, in certain places around about live me music venues, and that's why I moved as quickly as I did um, uh, in terms of uh, writing uh, to planning authorities. But I would reiterate um, that planning cannot deal uh, with folk moving into existing properties, existing housing, uh, who may not have the same opinions of those folks that were in those houses before them. And I think we've got to recognise that and also um, let folk out there understand um, that this applies to new development and not to what already exists, because I think that some folk out there are a little bit confused about what all of this is about. Well, I hope that the amendments in my name will remove that confusion by addressing both the issue of new development and the issue uh, of changes in uh, an existing neighbourhood. It is very important, I think, to be more ambitious than the Minister is being in, uh, in seeing what the planning system can do. And the planning system can protect live music venues. Uh, Adam Tompkins mentioned the case of King Tut's. The Minister will know of other cases in both Aberdeen and Edinburgh, and I'm sure there are others across the country where what we need is provision that protects those venues against development, which we know before it happens, if it happens, will lead to the closure of those venues. That is the, uh, the, the seriousness of the situation that live music venues currently face and the reason for taking action in the way that we've described. Now, the, the Minister uh, was concerned that unreasonable adjustment were, adjustments were not defined in the amendment 306. No, they're not. The expectation, of course, is that the government will bring forward the necessary regulations as under any other primary legislation in order to define that closely and precisely. Of course. Thank you very much. Um, so I've heard um, both from the Minister and, and Mr Tompkins uh, concerns that one of the perhaps unintended consequences of, of Amendment 306 is it could prevent um, Pe people live, living in these culturally significant zones and uh, I'm a bit like uh, Mr Tompkins I also used to live in a city centre it was Newcastle um, and uh, within uh, a stone's throw of uh, my flat was a dance studio just around the corner was a nightclub um, and I enjoyed living there um, so I I'm sure that's not what not your intention um, I, are you prepared to look at this for stage three? I, I certainly welcome Adam Tompkins' comments around the, 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 the way we address this at stage three. I prefer his proposition, which is that we agree these amendments today and come back at stage three to look at any, any refining that's required, rather than the Minister's proposal, which I think is not to uh, take these amendments forward and then 
uh, trust trust that, that he will come up with something that goes some of the way towards what we're seeking to do. The, the intention is not to prevent people living in culturally significant zones. The intention is to signal that if you choose to occupy a flat next to King Tut's, that's a good thing if you like live music, but it's not a very good thing if you want to get King Tut's closed down. And I think that is the, the, the nature of the choices that have to be made uh, in this case, and that's the reason that I, I will press my amendments, convener. Uh, I believe that they do achieve what is required, which is providing a clear legal basis for councils to protect, and planning authorities to protect live music venues. I think that's uh, the right thing to do, uh, and, and I think uh, they will provide uh, si significant benefit uh, in primary legislation that will protect our live music venues going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Therefore, the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, those in favour? Those opposed? That's 4 3 in favour. The amendment is agreed to. I call Amendment 129 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 177. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's agreed. Oh, sorry, my apologies. I never heard anybody. Uh, right, those in favour? Those opposed? The amendment is agreed 4 3. 5 2. 5 2. <laughs> oh, don't listen to me. <laughs> don't listen to me. Right. My, hi, my apologies. Right. The t t t co a Alec Cole Hamilton has said that he was not going to move the amendment 203. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, I call Amendment 28 in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 11. Uh, are you going to move that yeah, on his I'll behalf? Yeah, on behalf of Daniel Monica. Johnson. Okay, thank you. Therefore, the question is, that Amendment 28 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, those in favour? One. Those opposed? Six. Uh, amendment 28 falls. The question is, therefore, that Section 7 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. The question, section seven is agreed to by a claim. Um, to, to, to call amendment one thirty in the name of the minister. Minister to move formally or not? Uh, not moved. Thank you. I call amendment sixty seven in the name of Andy Whiteman. Already debated with amendment sixty six. Andy Whiteman to move or not? Moved. The question is that amendment sixty seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those against? Three, the amendments carried. Four, three. I call Amendment 68 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 66. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Yeah. I call Amendment 131 in the name of the Minister, previously debated with Amendment 66. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is, uh, if is Amendment 131 agreed? I claim 132 in the name of the Minister. Uh, moved, Convener. Moved and agreed. Uh, <laughs> is it agreed? Yeah, it's the question is, is that Kenny Gibson's fault there? I blame him. Uh, the question is, that Amendment 132 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I call Amendment 133 in the name of the Minister. Not moved, Convener. Thank you. I call Amendment 134 in the name of the Minister. Moved, Convener. The question is, uh, Amendment 134 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. It's agreed by a claim. I call Amendment 135 in the name of the Minister. Not moved. Thank you. And I call Amendment 136 in the name of the Minister. Not moved. Thank you. The question is, that Section 8 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed by a claim. Uh, I call Amendment 78 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 177. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed by a claim. I think this is okay. Right, okay. I call Amendments 137, 138, 178 and 179 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated with Amendment 177. Yeah? Yes. Unblock, convener. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 137, 138, 178 and 179? No. Thank you. The question is that amendments 137, 138, 178 and 179 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Approved by a claim. Thank you. 
I call Amendment 204 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 177. Monica Lennon to move or not? Move. move. The question is that Amendment 204 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Three. Those opposed? Four. The yeah, Amendment 204 falls. Call Amendment 180 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 177. Minister, to move formally. Moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 180 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. By acclaim. Call Amendment 205 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 177. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 205 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. The Amendment 205 is agreed to. Call Amendment 206 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 177. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 206 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Four. Those opposed? Three. 206 is agreed to. Okay. Call Amendment 139 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 177. Minister, to move Moved, forward. Convener. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. I call Amendment 87 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 177. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? Let's say uh, the amendment falls. Both of Yes, yeah, so the question is at section. Yeah. No, you don't need to. Right, okay. Well, in that case, that's uh, the end of this stage of stage two. Can I thank the Minister, his officials, and the other MSPs who attended today's meeting? Day four of the stage two will take place on 24th of October, when the committee's target is the end of part three. Uh, because of October recess, any further amendments up to the end of part three should be lodged by 12 noon on Thursday, 4th of October. And that concludes the, part, the public part of today's meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, and I suspend the meeting.